you and say, look, you learn more from your failures than from your successes. Specifically, in some ways, this has some resonance with I am a robotics researcher, and today I would like to share with you some of my thoughts about the topic, robots that learn from us. Before we talk about robotics, I'd like to start with the humans. I am a mother of a son, two-year-old boy. It's very interesting for me to observe the process of his development and how he interacts with the world, including people, and robots. He's now a source of my inspiration for my research in robotics. Let's think about the process of how humans learn motions. When we learn new sport, maybe we usually follow the three steps. First, we learn basic skills, movements, uh, with the help of the coach, so under supervision of coach. Then we practice this skill in order to improve or to, and to optimize that. And further, these learned skills can be further extended to the more complex scenarios. One approach to, to learning under supervision is imitation learning. Imitation learning is an interesting topic for different disciplines, including neuroscience, psychology, control engineering, and robotics. And it is a very nice approach. It's easy for the teacher to teach something just by showing it in a very natural way. And students can learn the general concepts also very easily. I applied this idea to robots. Here we can see a general users can program a humanoid robot even if they are not experts in robotics or computer programming. We, we applied different approaches for the different humanoid robots here. And you can see a humanoid robot can imitate human's motions, upper body motion and lower body motion in real time. And also you can see it can imitate lifting a food, also it can imitate walking behavior as well. In contrast to the most of humanoid robots walk with bent knee, our robots can also imitate with the knee stretched, you know, stretched knee walking as well. However, there is a side effect. You can see from this movie, actually. So even I didn't intend to, the, my robot to imitate every single of movement, he can even imitate my coughing as well. <coughs> Actually, transfer motions from one person to the other person is not always a straightforward. Humans have different body structure and body properties as well. The same applies to robots. Robots have different kinematics and dynamics. And this leads to another approach to learning under supervision, so-called kinesthetic teaching. This is basically the solving the problem of how we map one person's motion to the other person. So this is correspondence problem. And in this case, student doesn't have to care about this correspondence problem because a teacher does. And this is a very good approach for robots because it makes robots job easier since human will take care of this mapping problem with the human's brain. So we put a lot of cognitive load to the human's brain side. Yeah, however, there is a one downside. Human can teach maybe only one part of the body, like one arm. So it's hard for the robot to learn about synchronized whole body motion, especially when you think about very man many degrees of freedom robots. So we propose approach, incremental learning approach, based on combination of imitation learning and kinesthetic teaching. With this idea, I tried to taught a robot the famous perfection dance. 
I, as a first step, I showed this uh, perfection dance to a robot as an expert, although I'm not good at dancing at all. So anyway, he tries to imitate my behavior as a first step. And then here you see the robot's initially learned motion is not perfect, hand was too high. So I decided, okay, I want to show him another way using the physical coaching. So I just go and then pull, uh, pull down the robot's hand to the height of the eyes. And then this new demonstration goes into the incremental learning approach. And then it learns. And now here is the result of this. So you can see it's a very intuitive way a, for a general user to program robots. Just showing and then another demonstration. Very good. But what is next after this uh, supervised learning? Interesting about the learning is the effect afterwards. One thing is about is the generalization. Once we learn some motions, we can reproduce them again and again. And also we can generalize them in a different context, new situations. Actually, there has been a lot of uh, research contribution in robotic robot learning community in this area, generalization. The another effect about the after learning is recognition. So here is uh, markers attached on a human body. Can you tell what human pose is, what the action is? It's hard, right? So if we watch this, a lot of bunch of dots here as a movie, yeah, then you could actually realize human's motion. So human is running in a circle, and also we could tell the where human's configuration is. We could really see the human's pose roughly. And this is actually called the uh, biological movements in psychology. And then we could also apply this idea. Basically, when we do not have rich image information, we could use some movement information, like 2D optical floor information, in order to recognize and reconstruct human motions. Here is a result of the reconstruction of 56 degrees of freedom of human body, shown in blue. And for the comparison purpose, the ground truth is shown in magenta color. And you can see we could uh, reconstruct the motion in a reasonable well, even from the only limited information, like to the optical floor. So after supervision, right, supervised learning, however, there are some tasks which are hard to learn only from the supervision of teacher. For example, walking and use of chopsticks. Most kids, most babies, take their first steps around between 9 and 12 months, and they walk very well by the time when they are 14 or 15 months old. I think I maybe started to eat with the chopsticks when I was around 5, and I mastered this much later. And some of people never master these fine motor skills in their lifetime. So we know that we need some practice for some challenging tasks. This is actually correspond to the reinforcement learning in machine learning community. However, most reinforcement learning algorithms requires hundreds or thousand trials, even for relatively simple tasks. However, this might be unrealistic for some of robotics application, like bipedal walking. Most humanoid robots are rigid, and they are not designed against many faults. When I see this movie, Robot Falling movie from the DARPA Robotic Challenge this year, I cannot help say, ouch. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of something. A few years ago, we demonstrated our research 
at Automatica, which is the one of the biggest robotics fairs in Germany. My student was uh, confidently saying to the other colleagues that the producer of the robot had performed falling test and the robot passed. Few minutes later, our small humanoid robot now fell from the table and it broke the, his neck. And we had to stop our demos. So we decided to go for a less painful way for our robots and for us. So we proposed the online trial and error learning approach for the robots here by using some existing analysis. And in order to improve robot walking stability, the algorithm showed great results. So here we see the error of center of pressure, which is a well-used measure for the uh, stability, has been reduced by about 55%. And this video shows the algorithm's performance against unknown disturbances. So as you can see, compare our approach works better compared to a no learning case. So we went through two steps of our learning, and now can we scale that learned motions to different scenarios, like interacting with uh, another people, other people, like interaction. In order to motivate this, maybe you might have heard of the movie called Terminator. Uh, in the Terminator 2, there is an interesting scene that a boy teaches Terminator in interesting physical human robot interaction. So let's see this. It's different. It's when there's nothing wrong with you, but you're in anyways. You get it? No. <laughs> All right, my man! No problemo. Give me five. Just put out your hand like this. Come on. All right. Now hit me. Give me five. Do the same thing. Do the same thing. All right. Okay, that's good. That's good. Um, so here you see how the boy teaches the Terminator. Give me five physical interaction is right in a very simple way basically following imitation learning paradigm. First, the boy shows this motion and asks the terminator to imitate this, to put out the hand. And then he shows how to react to that, right, which is the interaction. And then he puts out hands again, ask the terminator to imitate that reaction. We can summarize the four important issues of the learning physical human robot interaction imitating one's motion and understanding motion primitives and understanding interaction rules and establishing inappropriate contact, not too hard, right? You shouldn't hit too hard. So we applied this idea, a humanoid robot in Japan. Robot has learned 12 motion primitives and eight interaction primitives. When it interacts with a human, it uses the motion primitives and interaction primitives it hasn't learned before. So it recognizes what human is doing and interpret what human want to do, what kind of interaction want to do. Based on that, it generates its reaction strategy. The numbers on the monitor basically say that the identified interaction primitives. And you can also see our robot also makes the contact appropriately, although my hand motion might be, you know, differently. You know, it's always a very, and also he doesn't hit me too hard. Similarly, the motion learning can be extended to human-robot cooperation, like carrying a table with a human and robot together. A key idea is incremental learning and prediction what the partner is going to do in the future. So as learning goes, robot gets better understanding about the task, and it can predict what the partner is about to do in the future. Based on the prediction, it can become more proactive to the task. 
We applied this idea on our robot, and experiment result shows that the, as the learning proceeds, the prediction error goes down, and this prediction enabled increase of the robot's contribution and decrease of the human's burden. When we turn off robot's assistance based on the prediction, again, human force goes back to the, its original value, which means robot is contributing to this uh, carrying a table task. So, when we compare machines with humans, machines nowadays are superior to humans in terms of computational power and precision of execution. However, my two-year-old boy work maybe is more capable than my robot even after 11 years of my research in terms of robustness to the uncertainties and adaptation to new situations. Although it has not been discovered how our brain works, our learning mechanisms seem to be a crucial key. That's why I would like to build robots that learn from us, and I strongly believe this will lead us to uh, intuitive robots which can coexist with us. Thank you.